Although a short passage from Luke's gospel, in fact, only five verses, Martha and Mary's story is so rich with images and ideas and application that it offers us the possibility of a thousand great sermons. It has all the makings of a great family drama. It offers a classic expose on the potential pitfalls of triangulation and presents a foundation for a terrific study on what Jesus really thinks about women's leadership in all facets of the church, just to name a few. And while exploring any of these would be a good use of our time together, as I thought about which way to go, I kept being drawn back to that very first sentence. The one that says, Jesus entered a certain village, and a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. The very idea of entertaining guests fills me with anxiety. Some of you have heard me say that I resonate a lot more with Rod Stewart than Martha Stewart. <laughs> and so the idea of arranging things like dinner parties invokes moments of real terror. So as I thought about the invitation in this story and Martha's anxiety about it, I, I immediately had several questions. Did Martha and Jesus have some sort of prior understanding that whenever he rolled into town, she would host him? Was she expecting him that day, or was this a surprise visit, like when a relative simply shows up on your doorstep and expects to be invited to stay? Did they have a close relationship or no prior relationship? Had they ever even met before? Or was she just offering, hoping that Jesus would say yes? D did she even know what he liked to eat? For in Luke's gospel, in fact, in all three of the synoptic gospels, this is the only mention of Martha and Mary. And there are a lot of unknowns here. Things would could have potentially fanned the flames of her anxiety about hosting such a popular guest, whether he was expected or not. It is no wonder, as she is bustling about the kitchen, it is not only her food that is cooking. Her resentment towards her sister Mary simmers and eventually boils over. Mary, seemingly oblivious to her social obligations, chooses instead to simply sit and listen to what Jesus has to say. Now, a show of hands here. How many of you can sympathize with Martha's point of view? Right? You get stirred into a tizzy, trying to get everything done while someone else in the house sits around and pretends not to notice. <laughs> and in fairness, who here resonates with Mary? There's always one. <laughs> you see, for Martha, anger replaces resentment and is followed by the sting of rebuke when Jesus doesn't side with her, but actually affirms Mary's choice, calling it the better part. You know, it's easy for us to think this is simply a story of comparison, right? Which of these women's actions is better? The problem with this way of thinking is that if one is better, then we are implying the other one must be what? Worse. And that's a big red flag for us because we know that the kingdom of God, the kingdom that Jesus is hard at work unfolding, it isn't at all about competition or comparison. We are all created in God's image and likeness and pronounced by God as good. Not good, better, best. Good, just as we are with all the gifts that we have and the ones that we don't. And Jesus himself came to serve, right? He taught, he healed, he traveled around the hillsides of Judea and fed the hungry. Moreover, nowhere in today's story does it say he wasn't expecting something to eat. He never discourages Martha from busying herself, rustling up the food. He, he doesn't say to her, Martha, 
Don't bother with all the fuss. Just throw some cheese and olives on a plate and come and sit down. So as tempting as it is for us to think of this interchange as a better than, worse than dilemma, I wonder what might change if we approach this story as a yes and example. In other words, what if we agree that Martha and Mary both had important gifts to offer? If we acknowledge that service and action and teaching and contemplation are equally important to bringing the kingdom of God nearer to us and into the world. Martha's issue was not that she was busy. She was distracted, being pulled or dragged in different directions. And a more accurate translation of the word actually used reveals that she was experiencing an unprecedented level of distraction and worry which was causing her to feel fractured by the many and competing tasks before her. Thomas Merton once noted, to allow oneself to be carried away by a multitude of conflicting concerns, to surrender to too many demands, to commit to too many projects, to want to help everyone in everything is itself to succumb to the violence of our times. So when Jesus rebukes Martha, it is his way of saying that her anxiety isn't really about the food. It's about the fact that her frenetic activity is pulling her away from the person that God created her to be. She is fracturing God's very creation. And that is manifested in part by how she lashes out on her sister. This is the only time in the Gospels that Jesus rebukes someone for showing devotion to him. So this kind of distraction, it is no small thing. This is an important thing to think about. It's like being so distracted, trying to make sure everything is just right for your children, that you snap at them when all they want is for you to stop and look at the picture that they drew for you. Or, or taking pride in your 80-hour work week that offers you the financial wherewithal to provide the best for your family, but you work at work and you come home and you put your cell phone on the dinner table in case an important text or email pops up and, and then you wonder how it is that you are a stranger in your own family. And then there's also another side, right? When we allow ourselves to be distracted by our cell phones and our Facebook posts, Pokemon Go, and the countless other diversions that are offered to us because, because they easily obscure the presence of God in the homeless guy that's hustling for change on the corner of Canal and Madison or the lady who is picking through the trash can in search of food because then it's easy not to see them. So I wonder, when Jesus comes around, hoping to find an invitation and a place in your heart, what might he discover? Would he find that we live a life so full and frenzied that there is no time for the Spirit to enter, much less make a dwelling? Or will we, will we like Mary, dare to choose the one thing, the only thing that cannot be taken away, and invite him in? Not, not because we are exceptional hosts and hostesses, but because we realize that we are enough. Amen. <laughs>